go there because I love young people and I'm really here to try to help you today. I'm here to try to help you understand your world today that I promise you, you do not understand. And that's not a criticism. Today's world is complex and it's getting worse all the time. You've heard the statistic how knowledge doubles something like every two and a half years. Knowledge, period, just doubles on earth. Technology is like a streak of lightning racing into a future that mankind is incapable of handling because of its sin nature that has gone unredeemed. And in these latter decades of America that we're now living in, we are living in the end and the death of the last great free Christian nation on earth. We're living in a time of the death of common sense. Political correctness has replaced common sense. It's replaced national security. It's replaced our population's ability to elect anybody with real intelligence, real historical understanding, real knowledge of what's going on in the Middle East, and a host of subjects that they are incapable of dealing with. And I want to say to you this morning, You've taken polygraph, and I'm glad for you. Listen, man, this is the coolest class in the United States. This is the neatest thing I can imagine. I've never heard of it before anywhere. It may be one in a thousand schools that has anything like this. It may be one in ten thousand. So I hope that a lot of you have taken the class for the right reasons. And I suppose maybe there are no wrong reasons, but, you know, I know... I'm sorry, I put that on your desk, man. I think God bless America mug right there. What about vitamin and water? Amen. But I'll tell you what. Oh, I can have fun, but we're going to get serious today, I'll tell you. Uh, but anyway, you might have taken it because you heard it was a blast, you know, and some nutcases are going to come in and froth and spit and cry and, you know, rip a gut and wave their Bible and tell you all about firearms and the Second Amendment and all that crazy stuff. So it is a blast. I know it is. A, it's a cool thing. And I really enjoy doing it. I think it's the coolest thing that I get to do. And part of the reason for that is... The churches and the preachers of today are cowards and idiots feathering their own nest just hoping all this trouble is going to go away. And I can't get near the pulpit of a church and tell them what God has to say about the mess we've made out of this nation. So I tell you that to tell you that I really get a kick out of doing polygraph because I finally get a place to speak somewhere. Right? And this is really cool. Now, some of you, I hope, took polyrad because... You actually wanted to begin to comprehend what's happening on earth, and you're interested in politics and government and the course of the nation, and hopefully you're interested in your own future. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not here to bear bad news this morning, but I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to have to give you a reality check this morning. And I think there's a couple other speakers uh, on the speaker series list that I saw uh, that are going to do that too, and hopefully you'll soak some of it up. So, if you've come to the classroom this morning, and you've heard something about my presentations in the past, and, oh, he's this right-wing extremist nut job, and I used to wear a red, white, and blue belt buckle, and kids used to say, well, he came in the classroom with a frying pan-sized belt buckle and cowboy boots and a red, white, and blue tie, and I just turned him off. Well, she's an idiot, okay? That's about fight. She's an idiot. Don't be an idiot, okay? Use your head for something besides growing hair and wearing your Michigan hat, amen. I'm just kidding with you, man. I could care less about the fuck guys either. That's idolatry of Columbus, Ohio. It's on tape. I don't care who likes it and who doesn't. Listen, man, Rome, the Roman Empire collapsed over sports and pleasure and entertainment and losing their moral soul and their national will and convictions and their ethics. And just before Rome fell, they had dedicated over 160 days a year to Colosseum events. And so, we're almost there. We're almost there. And all the sports garbage makes the headlines. Now, there are some honorable things about sports and teamwork and effort and labor and weightlifting and tuning up the body and endurance and strength and training. And I respect all those things. But don't make an idol out of the world of sports because actually it's a distraction to the fact that America is disintegrating before our eyes. So just don't get too caught up in it. Don't let it become your God. And I can speak to that issue because motocross racing was my God when I was a young person. I want to tell you also that uh, what I'm going to tell you this morning was not rammed down my throat or taught me by my parents or any preachers on earth. And I came from quite the other side of the fence on my political and spiritual views of this day. I didn't give my life to Christ until I was 23. Come on in, 23 and a half years old. 
And uh, I made a lot of mistakes and uh, broke a lot of hearts. Uh, my friends, uh, girlfriends, parents, educators. I was a train wreck as a young person. And so I tell you that to tell you that nobody's brainwashed me. I learned it in the school of hard knocks. I learned what life is about and what it's not about. And I want to tell you this morning, it's not about houses, cars, lands, and stocks and bonds and some corporate position and being a CEO and making millions of dollars. Because during the Great Depression, it was the millionaires that were jumping out of the windows because they had no spiritual root in themselves to even know what life is really all about. You'll see a bumper sticker that says, he that dies with the most toys wins. That's garbage. And I'll read something about this point. Just... Uh, kind of came to mind here. So there's many reasons for taking polyred. I hope some of you took it for the right reason. I know I'm not going to reach all of you. I wish I could. But don't come in here with a predisposed attitude to reject myself or Dave Daubenmeyer or some other conservative. Don't do it. You haven't been around long enough to make that kind of a decision. And more important than that, I could care less if you reject me. But don't reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not put God out of your thinking at this beginning young stage of your life. You hadn't been around long enough. You hadn't experienced enough treachery and violence and crime and workplace political correctness where our college professors, the goggle-eyed idiots that believe we came from the cosmic slime from eternity past in a polywalk turned into a bird, turned into a beast, turned into a man. Listen, man, you're better than that. And I hope your brains are capable of grasping the fact that you're better than that. And evolution is a farcical lie that's being disproven by modern science every day that goes by. So don't fall for it. And don't come to Polyrad with dispositions made ahead of time. There's been a lot of that I've received in the written reviews. I feel sorry for those kids. I don't despise them. I feel sorry for them. Because you're entering into a world that has gone mad. Now, I hope you're keeping up with world events some. I hope you're keeping up. Because America is melting down. The world financial system is collapsing. China is becoming the world's superpower. The nut job Ahmadinejad of Iran is going to probably bomb Tel Aviv, Israel with a nuclear weapon in the next one to two years. You're going to live to see amazing things happen in your young lifetime. And I want to tell you, uh, I'm going to read you something here in a second that is the great decision that you're going to make. Listen, before you leave home, before you leave the counsel and wisdom of your parents and some of your counselors and teachers here at school, before you leave this wonderful environment of girlfriends and boyfriends and banquets and parties and concerts and, and Friday night ball games, listen, before you leave this wonderful time in your life and go out there and face the college world and the workplace, Get yourself a set of core principles. You better form them now. Because when you go out into that world, the professors are going to try to destroy you, and the workplace will destroy you. Unless you just fall in line with it and go with the flow and become a useful idiot to Satan in the destruction of America, leading us to, to, to a nightmare of collapse. And you'll wind up being a good little useful idiot in the end time, bloodthirsty, nightmarish regime of the Antichrist because Armageddon is at our door this morning. So I want you to get yourself a set of core principles. So let me help you this morning. Try to figure out what life is really all about and what it's not. And the miracle of America and how we rose to prominence and became the greatest nation on earth in the shortest period of time in history that anybody did and the other nations had a several thousand year head start. Ponder that sometime. But core principles. And I found at 23 and a half years old that God's way was the only way to have a useful, meaningful life full of purpose and confidence. And I'm facing cancer right now, and they told me I'm gone in six to eight months. But I have confidence in the Lord God Almighty, and I'm doing my part, and I'm going to trust Him to do His part. And that's a piece of why I have to talk to you so sternly today. So please don't reject me without giving me a hearing, okay? I'm here to help you. I love young people. I love this country probably more than anybody you know. Except maybe this brother here and Dave Dobbenmeyer. <laughs> this brother here. But I'll tell you what. I'd like to see this thing make it. 
until God puts the hammer fist of judgment down. But we're collapsing ahead of time. We're dying as a nation today. I want you to hear this. This is an old book. I go to bar, uh, barn sales and flea markets and garage sales and things and, and library sales and pick up old books. This kind of stuff's gone. By the way, uh, the public school curriculum in the United States of America concerning <clears throat> American history is a castrated, emasculated, politically correct, revisionist, stinking pack of lies. And we'll talk about the pilgrims today since it's Thanksgiving week. And I'll tell you the pilgrims were some of the choicest people that God ever created. And they laid the foundation for the covenant relationship between God and man for their lives, sustenance, families, communities, government, law, courts, justice, self-defense, banking, lending, everything you can think of. The pilgrims are the choicest vine of the earth. And nobody knows anything about them today because they've been ripped from the textbooks except for maybe one brief comment. How they came seeking religious and civil freedom. But you don't know the hell that they went through in Europe before they got here. Maybe we'll have time to cover some of that this morning. Here's the choice, young people. It sometimes seems that patriotism or good citizenship is the virtue which includes all virtues. The question, here it is, what is the chief end of man? What's it all about? To which the catechism gives the solemn and sublime answer to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. The Christian catechism was part of early American education in the schools of the colonies and beyond. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever comes back to every generation that has risen above the beast. It may be that it will turn out that there are but two answers. One answer, that which has just been made by our Puritan ancestors, which we have just quoted, glorify God and enjoy Him forever. The other answer is the beast's answer, which the beast gives unconsciously. Now, this beast is the sin nature in man. The beast gives unconsciously. Well, knowing its meaning, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Now, here's the choice. Life for the glory of God or life for the indulgence of yourself. Between these two, the youth are to take their choice. It's not about houses, cars, land, stocks, bonds, promotions, and becoming a big shot. I'll tell you what I believe life is about. I'm 57 years old. I may not make 58. I'm going to tell you what life is about. Life is about God, faith, family, friends, relationships, and country. That's what life is about. I'm not putting down anybody else's country. But we just happen to be God's chosen instrument for the latter half of the span of time, the New Testament time period, we, we didn't spring up until right here went screaming to the top. China, Japan, Russia, England, Europe, India, all the countries of the world. And how is it that we go screaming to the top? Well, it's because Father Knows Best. There was a TV show out of the 60s. Father Knows Best. Yeah, God the Father Knows Best, and that's the whole root of the American success story. But now we're being destroyed because we think we know better. Our courts think they know better. Our political leaders are deaf, dumb, and blind for the most part to what's happening on the planet. And one communist writer years ago in a French communist publication wrote this about the American politician. He said, it is we who communists will ultimately win. Because you people are not willing to soil your hands in defense of your liberty and your politicians can't see past the next election. And he was quite right in that observation. And we have become fat, stupid, lazy, historically <coughs> illiterate, greedy, selfish, wanting a handout, a bailout, another stimulus package, another government check. And we're at the place where we just crossed two days ago $15 trillion of indebtedness. We just crossed that line. That line eats up the entire gross domestic product of this country. That means all the money that is made in a year's time is now totally consumed by the debt. How many of you have gone to the website usdebtclock.org? Anybody? All right. Well, amen. Well, I am glad. That's the best response I've ever gotten from a polyrad class on that. The $100,000 column changes every five seconds. 100000 bucks. 
uh, while we're in here in the room this morning, call it, call it an hour's time, every five seconds. So uh, times 12 is 60 seconds in a minute. So that 100,000 becomes 1.2 million a minute times 60 minutes. Go figure. I mean, you know, $72 million, uh, uh, you know, a further indebtedness while we're just meeting for an hour in the classroom. That's insane. I mean, most of your parents probably make uh, maybe 50000 a year every two seconds. Uh, that goes down the drain with foreign oil expenditures. Foreign oil expenditures. Are you, are you a radical environmentalist? Are you tree hugger this morning? Do you think the life of a mosquito is as valuable as the life of a human being? Are you aspiring to be president of the Sierra Club and try to save the earth while the unborn child is murdered by the millions across this country and others every day that goes by? You're sick. You're sick. Nothing wrong with preserving the environment, but America's engaged in Gaia worship. Gaia the earth goddess. Earth worship. Sun, moon, and the stars. In the Old Testament, it was called Baal worship. Now, the money going to foreign oil represents national suicide because 60 to 70 percent of that goes to uh, Islamic countries, mainly Saudi Arabia. And they are exporting radical Islam all over the world. And so we're paying for them to do that because the tree huggers and Obama won't let us drill for our own oil. And we've got 500 years of oil in Alaska and hundreds of years of natural gas under the continent. And God put it there, by the way. And so we're committing national suicide because of political correctness. And I'll tell you something. Obama is the most pathetic, inexperienced, anti-capitalist, anti-American, anti-Christ piece of human political garbage that has ever disgraced the halls of government in the United States of America. And I stand on that. And those idiots in the Secret Service can put a bullet in me. But I'm going to tell the truth as long as there's breath in me. He is a disaster. He spent 158 days total in the U.S. Senate. And we made him head of the free world. He never served in the military. He's never run a business. Never even run a shoe shine shop. Never met a payroll. You know what he's done his whole life? Community organize, agitate, go to college, and give speeches on political science. And that's damning enough. But he happens to be a far-left, God-hating socialist communist at his heart. How many of you know who Bill Ayers is? Weather Underground. Anybody know Bill Ayers? I'm glad a couple of you know. Clue everybody in someday, okay? Communist revolutionary from the 1960s. Obama's Senate campaign for Illinois was launched in Bill Ayers' living room. Vernon E. Norm, communist. Van Jones, Obama's green job czar, communist. Anita Dunn, handpicked by Obama, White House press secretary Anita Dunn. One of her two favorite people on earth is Mao Zedong. Communist. Idiot! She was forced to resign, thank God, because Glenn Beck outed her with that stupid, blasphemous communist remark. Dear God, man. This man, look, look, grasp the power of a presidency. It's not about who's handsome. It's not about who's well-spoken. It's not about whether his opposition stumbles over his words or can't talk as well as you'd like him to talk. It's not about how pretty his wife is and how nice his kids are. It's about, is he an American? And now we've elected one that's not even qualified to be president because his birth certificate is a stinking forgery. He has a relative that works in the passport and birth certificate place in Hawaii. They stole a social security number from a dead man in the state of Connecticut, and that's Obama's social security number. You say, well, why can't something be done about it? The same reason we couldn't get rid of Bill Clinton when we tried to impeach him. That reprobate, adulterous, fornicating, godless monster Bill Clinton. You know why we couldn't get rid of him? Because impeachment has to go through the U.S. Senate. And as long as the God-hating left has the Senate, there's no point in pursuing impeaching anybody on the left because they'll not allow it to take place. One of the points on the outline, and uh, <clears throat> Judy's going to give you these. I'm going to run through them quickly. Well, I'm not getting very far this morning, but I'm just speaking to you from the heart. One of the points on the outline is that leftism is the damnation of the human race. <clears throat> And we'll go into, in a minute here in the center of the board here, we'll go into what happened in the year 1776. And basically, it is when Satan's end-time plan for the human race got into high gear through what was known as the Bavarian Illuminati, and God Almighty answered their declaration of atheistic godlessness with the Declaration of Independence a couple months later in July of 1776.
That's what happened in that year. It's not just about us. It's about the fate of the free world. Let me run through this outline quickly. I don't have copies yet. Uh, Judy will make these for you. Look over my entire outline before you write your reviews, please, because there's a lot in here, and I will not be able to cover it all this morning. Point one, spiritual concepts matter. It matters what you think about good and evil, whether they even exist. It matters what you think about right and wrong. It matters whether you believe there are moral absolutes in this universe or if you just believe that anything goes and man is just by random chance developed out of the cosmic slime from eternity past with no plan, no blueprint, no designer. And if you believe that, you're, you're a good candidate uh, for being a permanent lifetime idiot and a non-productive member of civilization. And you better start investigating some of the miraculous bodily systems that could not have evolved, like the eye, like the ear, like the brain, like the blood clot system, that is an amazing design system with pain sensors and blood pressure sensors, a biofeedback mechanism that causes the blood vessels to constrict, coagulants injected into your bloodstream upstream, anticoagulants downstream, constant pressure and bleeding, monitoring by the brain, and it all happens without you and I even giving it a thought. That's called intelligent design. Make the leap. God is the designer. So it all matters. Spiritual concepts matter. Bad consequences can have, bad decisions can have long-term consequences. I will not elaborate. I used to spend a lot of time here because I lost I lost three of my high school friends on graduation night in 1972 because of drinking and driving. And I lost another one that lived, but I lost him because he went car surfing and smashed his skull on a signpost and turned into a four-year-old. Bad decisions have long-term consequences. Freedom is predicated upon righteousness, God's righteousness, not our thoughts. And uh, I'll give you a root. I'll give you a root of where law and justice and freedom and the stability of human civilization comes from, ultimately it comes from God, but the founders, many of them were lawyers, many were preachers. They were all educated. They were all brilliant men. There are some standouts, but all of them studied Blackstone's commentaries on the law. A man from England, one of the geniuses of God's design for justice. And I want to read you this. William Blackstone speaking, his law, God's law. His law of nature, dictated by God himself, is superior to any other. It is binding over all the globe, in all countries, at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this. And such of them as are valid derive all their force and all their authority, immediately or immediately from this original. Now I want you to get this. Upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation, depend all human laws. Human laws are only declaratory of and act in subordination to divine law. Now back to that second to the last statement. Upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation, and all human laws. And the Declaration of Independence in the first paragraph. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth that separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. The laws of nature and of nature's God. That's where they got them. Blackstone. Blackstone got them from English common law. English common law comes from scripture. Now there's no getting around this stuff, and I know you're not learning this in high school, but I'm trying to help you today to understand that our nation is being destroyed because we've destroyed the foundations. In fact, <laughs> Psalm 11.3 declares, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let me run through that for those of you that love scripture, those of you that want to know what God thinks about the whole deal. I'm going to tell you what God thinks about government. You can write these down. You check me on these verses. 
And if you're a young Christian this morning and you want to aspire to doing something to save in your country and something to see in the salvation of your friends and see America survive and have a decent life, you better hear what God says about this whole thing. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. That's a shame and a disgust. Proverbs 29.2, here's your responsibility to vote and take part in the political process from the Word of God. Proverbs 29.2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. M-O-U-R-N, like a funeral because the nation's being destroyed. Psalm 33.12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. That's a psalm and not a proverb. And if there was an opposite to that psalm, it would be this. Cursed is the nation whose God is not the Lord. We are falling apart in every area because God is no longer Lord over America. Let's see. Psalm 11.3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And pay attention to this one. Psalm 9.17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. 2 Samuel 23, 3. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And here's the kicker. Here's the clincher, number 7. Isaiah chapter 9, 6 and 7. This is the case-closed argument as to whether or not God has any concern or has spoken anything concerning the realm of government. This ought to shut the book. What to God America's preachers would tell their congregations what I'm sharing with you this morning? They're scared to death. They're more scared of the ACLU in a lawsuit and a tax-exempt status being revoked by the stinking IRS. They're more afraid of some alphabet soup government agency than they are of the God who supposedly called them to preach. He didn't call them. They're hirelings. They're professional armchair theologians can't see the forest for the trees that were burning down. But the clincher to a list of seven verses that make the case for God and government is Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. In his throne will it be established with justice and judgment and righteousness from henceforth now and forever. And I butchered that a little bit, but you check it out, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Case closed. God has spoken on human freedom and the realm of government. There's a colloquialism that flies around America. I hear it all the time. <clears throat> well, I never discuss politics and religion because politics are in the act. You, you can't come to agreement. I, I just never discuss those two things. Let me counter that. God gave me this a couple of years ago. Let me counter the idea that religion and politics should never be discussed because it just ends up in an argument. Maybe it does. You know why? Because some are serving God and some are serving Satan. Because some are God-hating leftists and some are sold out to the gospel of Christ. It's going to cause a controversy. Jesus Christ may be the most controversial figure in human history because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father by, by me. You don't get any more controversial than that. But on this matter of never discussing religion or politics. If you don't discuss politics, your nation goes to hell. And if you don't at least investigate the realm of religion, you're going to go to hell. And I'll tell you what, I'm not being ornery. I'm telling you God gave me that about five years ago after I got so sick of hearing this argument that people and relatives and friends and barbershop and beauty shop, you know, just can't go there, can't go to religion and politics. That's garbage. That's garbage. So we have now an executive branch filled with atheistic, humanist, pro-Palestinian, anti-Israeli, pro-UN, anti-Founding Fathers, constitution trampling, political garbage idiots that are destroying this nation. All right, $15 trillion debt. Uh, since the nation was founded, that's the accumulating total. That's the cumulative total of our national debt. We're bankrupt. We're done. It's not going to be fixed. How many of you know that just yesterday the super committee failed? It was going to try. Super committee failed. Yep. Yep. 
So now the automatic cuts go in and 500 billion is coming out of the fence. That's not good. That's not good. But it's all, it, it all boils down, young people, it all boils down to uh, this great contest between good and evil, God and Satan. Truth versus error. Righteousness versus iniquity. That's what it all boils down to. And so, if we're going to save the nation, if we're going to repent, we're going to return. We're going to have revival, or we're going to be ruined. We're going to plead with God for mercy, or we're going to be destroyed. We're going to experience national repentance, or we're going to receive a death sentence. And that death sentence is going to come as it is coming now in the form of obvious national weakness on a world scale to our enemies. And that super committee failing is probably going to mean that we get another downgrade in the national economy in relation to the nation of the world. <clears throat> but this judgment, this retribution, this punishment is going to come probably by way of a combination of Islamic terrorism and maybe a first strike by Russia or China or both, throw North Korea in there, and uh, let's face it, I mean, we have no borders. Our big cities are infested with drug gangs and cartels. Forty, let's see, approaching 40,000 people have died on the southern border of the United States because of the drug war in the last two to three years. That exceeds the death rate, the death toll of the Vietnam War. It took 10 years. 58,000 died, but it was a 10-year combat actual war. And 40,000 have died in two, three, four years. It exceeds the death rate of a war situation. It's a war zone. What is this administration's response to the war zone on the southern border? Well, they're suing the state of Arizona for trying to do something about their state border. There's a sheriff out there named Sheriff Joe Arpaio. He's the toughest sheriff in the United States. Eric Holder of Obama's Justice Department is personally suing him for trying to enforce immigration law that's on the books. Our leaders are a pack of truth rejectors in the executive branch. Now we had a bit of putting the brakes on in 2010. And uh, I'm not a born-again Republican. I'm a born-again Christian and conservative, but I'm not a born-again Republican because they've made many of us conservatives sick for a long time too. But, but the right of the political spectrum is largely pro-God, pro-family, pro-life, pro-strong military, pro-national security, and pro-job business growth. And they are pro-America being the world's leading superpower. The Democratic left hates everything that God ever said was right. They are pro-death rather than pro-life. They are pro-lesbian, sodomite, transgender, GBLT. They're pro all of that stuff that destroys the family, which is the basic building block of human civilization and of any society that uh, desires to stay in one piece for very long. They really can't stand the military, but they tolerate it so they can continue to live here in peace and freedom. They're always out to slash the defense budget. They are evil. They are Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels' Communist Manifesto dreams being realized before our eyes. They don't believe in the twin concepts of good and evil. You know why? Because they're spiritual. And they will not go there. I'm going to tell you something. We put the brakes on slightly in 2010 by getting control back to at least somewhat of the right side of the political spectrum. And I'm not ramming Republicans down your throat, and I'm not ramming George Bush Jr. down your throat. And we've had four administrations in a row, including his, his dad, Bush Sr., that have uh, put us on a path to annihilation. 
And so it's not Republican Democrat, but it is it is good and evil. And so if we if we continue on this train of borrowing and spending and handing out government checks and stimulizing the economy with somebody else's tax dollars that's working for them, and now we're borrowing money from China to do all this. See, we've created a situation now where about 45% of our population draws some kind of federal government assistance. And so they're just naturally not going to bite the hand that feeds them. And it's been proven now. they figured it out. they figured out that the Democrats are for all the social programs. And even though in the back of their mind they know that the Republicans want to keep the country safe and the border secure and the military in one piece, they allow themselves to override that sense of common sense and just say, give me the benefits, I'm voting Democrat. And so now when the Republicans talk about lowering taxes, 45% of the people don't care. In fact, 45% welcome more taxes because they know that's where their bread is buttered. Does that make sense? I hope you're getting that. And this is what socialism does. This is what creeping socialism does. And it destroys free enterprise. It destroys individual self-effort and work and sweat and the entrepreneurial spirit. It destroys all the things that made us the greatest nation on earth and gave us the financial excess and resources to do research and development, to build a, spro a space program, to have the greatest military on earth. And thank God it was in the hands of a Christian nation. But see, the excess and the wealth and the prosperity and the blessings... They come from a foundation that was laid in God's design all the way from the pilgrims and before them the Protestant reformers and the Puritans coming shortly after the pilgrims and establishing communities and cities and towns and states on the laws of nature and of nature's God. Now we've spit on all that and we are reaping the whirlwind because we have sown to the wind. Minor Prophet Hosea, about 8-7. All right, let me see what I can cover. I need a time check. We have about 10 minutes, 11 minutes left. Not in the whole class. In the whole class? In the whole class. So I didn't get the Q&A yet. Yeah, that was going to make you 10 minutes. All right, I'll tell you what. All right, all right. I'm going to shut up. You see what's on the board. I'll take questions at this time. It doesn't have to be on something I covered because I didn't scratch the surface. Yes, sir. Um, so you're for the Constitution, then, right? Well, that's, 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 yeah, okay. So freedom of religion is obviously a big thing in that. Um, you had mentioned earlier that in that in the political in the executive branch that there's atheists and pro-Muslim and yada, yada. I can prove it by the czars. The list of 32 yes. czars that Obama yes. appointed, yes. I can prove it. Their okay. own statements are um, unbelievable. But they they have chosen the freedom of to believe a different religion or a different set of beliefs rather than Christianity. How how can you um, like, it spite them for their beliefs when it's freedom of religion is in our Constitution. Well, they're children of the devil, frankly. Okay. okay? You know, uh, that, that's what it boils down to. That's very tough. That's very harsh. But, but beyond my feelings about leftism, okay, and, and I want you to read it on the outline when you, when you get them, damnation of the human race. Here's the thing. It's not just about whether we survive or not, okay? Whether we like it or not, young people, God has given to this nation the commission of being. The end time. Listen, this is the timeline. 4000 AD creation. The cross is the crossroads of human history. New Testament time period. Middle Ages. Dark Ages. We broke out of the Dark Ages because the Word of God was reintroduced to human civilization by the Protestant reformers. But even Protestantism in Europe was rotting to the core. And kings and queens thought they were the head of the church. And so the pilgrims and Puritans knew that Christ was the head of the church. That's the main reason for coming here. And you've read in your books, baby, religious and civil freedom. Well, there was tyranny in government. There was also tyranny in religion. So they come here, and they build this thing at the end of time. This is a 6,000-year timeline of history. And all the way down here, we finally get it right. So I'm still answering your question, okay? It's not about what I think. It's about what human history declares emphatically and authoritatively. That we have been given by God, whether you want to believe this or not, I'm telling you, we've been given by God the mantle of benevolent responsibility for human freedom and to be the missionary outpouring the headquarters for the gospel being poured out to the nations down here in the end of time. 
And so, I don't hate those people. I feel sorry for those people because they're going to perish for all eternity in the lake of fire. Okay? But I tell you what. You get a hold of the material on Obama's czars and you check them out. And I mean, these people, these people, look, they hate capitalism, which is the engine of our economic success. Okay? Uh, they hate coal, oil, nuclear. Uh, they're destroying us. Obama's making Brazil. Uh, we've sent technology to Brazil. Uh, I've got a friend that works on an oil platform. He's the captain. He steers the thing. He's an oil platform uh, supervisor. And he's in some distant ocean somewhere over in Singapore getting repair work done so he can go to Brazil and drill for, drill for oil off of the coast of South America, but not in our Gulf. I mean, it's unbelievable. So they hate big business, and they're crushing small business. Small business is where most of the jobs are. I mean, it's unbelievable. So they're anti-capitalist, pro-death, uh, weak military, not doing anything about the border, so they're destroying the United States as leftism. They're destroying the U.S. And since we have been given this role by God, as we are destroyed, our enemies sensing, like a shark sensing blood in the water. Listen, you young people, <laughs> if you don't die in a car wreck in the next couple of years, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to live to see this thing go up in flames. We're inside of 12 months now for real chaos and violence in our streets because we're going to be downgraded again. And the money is being sucked out of this country by the second. And the American dollar is going to soon be dumped as the world's leading currency. And it'll probably happen right after we get our next downgrade. And oil is not going to be traded in dollars anymore. And when we lose the ability to stabilize ourselves by printing money out of thin air and, and, uh, and uh, borrowing it from communist red China and other national governments, we're being repossessed. So finally, in answering your question, it's not about us, it's not about me. It's about the fate of human freedom on planet Earth. Consider for a moment what is left when America falls or is attacked or is crushed. What's left is a rising superpower in communist red China, uh, a failed European Union coming, and uh, North Korea's starving army, communist, nuclear capable power, uh, militant Islam, nuclear Iran, and little old Israel over there all by herself. Because Obama and his people, including Bush Jr. and Condoleezza Rice and Cheney and Roosevelt and Clinton and Bush Sr. have systematically and slowly forsaken our God-given obligation to Israel. And just before I take your question, I've got to show you this. If you don't think that relationship is important, I'm just going to tell you something. <laughs> Genesis 12 says, concerning Israel, God said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. And the cursing is coming down on us. But we've been their best friend and ally for a long time. And that's why the USA is right in the center of the word Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is forever. It's the hot spot of planet Earth. It's the most hotly contested piece of real estate on the face of the Earth. And that's where Christ is going to return and Armageddon takes place just north of Jerusalem. All right, your question. Um, you said evolution doesn't exist. And I wanted to ask you, how do you explain Pac-6 is basically the same genetic code in every organism's eye? Like, how do you explain that? All right, what was Not the Not being evolution. Pac-6, it's the basic genetic code in every organism's eye. Okay, genetic code, that's interesting. So, what, so what's the genetic code? Are we talking like the DNA strand and things? And, uh, okay, that code is information. That DNA strand is highly organized, okay? There are, there are two kinds of evolution. There is micro and macro, okay? There is micro within a line of species, but the interspecies lines, like the, the missing link thing, every last theoretical propounder of a missing link has been disproven, disproven, disproven over the last 150, 200 years. It's just nuts. And so, uh, I'm not a creation scientist as some are. I'm not a scientist. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe what God said about the thing because his laws being violated are at the root of everything. And this evolution issue, this evolution issue is at the crux of everything. And one of the main promoters of nihilism is, uh, is Nietzsche. And all right, so you brought up evolution. All right, now when, when did this take place? Okay, when did this thing get into high gear? We got into high gear with Darwin. And your question prompts me to go to this section that we didn't cover. A revolution of human thinking took place from 1850 to 1900. And evolution 
is the beginning of the questioning of everything that God ever said. 1848 was the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels, atheistic godlessness, a world government without God. Darwin, 1859, Ingersoll, agnosticism was on the rise. Brilliant lawyer turned his whole life into blasting the Christian faith. Nietzsche, nihilism, nothing matters. There are no values. There's nothing permanent. God is dead was his major platform. William James, father psychology. Freud, psychoanalysis, perversion, child sexuality, man's the center of everything. And Blavatsky, at the end of that period, uh, founds the New Age movement on esoteric occultism. So what I'm saying is, this time period sets the stage for the 20th century, which Nietzsche said, as an atheistic, God-hating evolutionist, Nietzsche said, if my theories are ever completely embraced and adopted, the next century will be the bloodiest on record. And what did we have? World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and then towards the end of it, the War on Terror. When we forsake God and what he says about human nature, when we forsake the idea, as the psalmist said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and that my soul knowest right well. I mean, when we forsake what we are in relation to the plant kingdom or the animal kingdom or the insect world or the fowl or the fish, when we do that, uh, life has no meaning. You lose any sense of a relationship with God or a purpose, and it all ends up where it's going, and it's going towards an antichrist, one world totalitarian regime that includes all the nations. All right, you already had one. Can I take you? Yeah. yeah. Um, does the devil have to be, uh, does the Bible have to be taken literally? So does the devil, can that, like, exist as a state, like, what we think of when it comes to, like, greed, selfishness, all the bad things that we think about, you know, like, can that just exist as a figurative concept? And could the devil exist in things like money and things like, you know, all these, all these things that you say are bad that I totally Well, agree. those are all temptations. That's a good oh, absolutely. observation. So can't, can't Satan, does, does Satan have to be this sort of, this sort of figure that, that we see in paintings? Okay, I didn't do that. Dante Oh, oh absolutely. Oh, no, 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 I totally understand. Yeah. Like, I'm saying, like, does it have to exist in this figurative sense? Does hell have to exist? Or can it just exist as a state of mind? Well, it's, uh, I mean, you don't have to paint pictures, and you don't have to have a you know, guy holding a pitchfork with a red tail and all that stuff. I mean, I understand it, but, uh, but see, all the evils, see, they are the natural inclination of man because of the fall, because of the sin nature. And, and so we, if we don't have the Holy Spirit in us and, and we're able to resist those things, then we fall into the trap of those temptations. I don't call it the devil. I just deal with it as the sin nature. So but, that he is, exists, but he is the father of lies and the author of it. Okay, the author of the That's what he is. Uh, he's the great deceiver. By the way, he's not ugly either. And he was one of the most beautiful angels in heaven. He was the heaven's choir director. He was gifted in music and all kinds of things. And he rebelled and drew a third of the host with him. Uh, come after class. Okay, is that the end of it? Is that it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. You can go. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, what, what's your response to uh, the liberals like such as Harry Reid and the Mormon, you know, liberals who are also like uh, into a time when <clears throat> the nation is dying, it's being destroyed, and it appears in, intentionally destroyed uh, by the forces of God-hating damnable leftism, that the ridiculously stupid and historically illiterate population of this country has seen fit to elevate to positions of power in the executive branch that make all the decisions. And so our founding principles are being crushed into the dirt, and they are our strength, and God is our strength, and godless leftism is incapable of solving anything or putting forth anything of a constructive nature to preserve the nation because they won't recognize good and evil, they don't appreciate uh, when life begins. Uh, they worship trees and whales and spotted owls and have no problem with killing the unborn child. Therefore, they put themselves as enemies of God. God is the author of human freedom. I mean, this thing is a spiral. This thing is spiraling out of control, and it's largely uh, because of the ignorance and blasphemy and collapse of critical thinking and common sense in the American population. Uh, we have, we have a, a system of government that requires knowledgeable, righteous, decent, sane, godly citizens for it to survive. Freedom is predicated upon righteousness, God's righteousness. It's not the idea of some man. 
Uh, it came directly from the Word of God. This is Thanksgiving week. Somebody tell me something about the pilgrims. Anything you can think of about the pilgrims. Why did they come here? Because they were religious persecution. Okay. What other kind of persecution? Religious and blank freedom. Usually it's in the books like that. But uh, governmental as well. You know, Tyranny and religion. Tyranny and government. Uh, the pilgrims were the choicest vine of the earth and the finest people on earth, and they paid their creditors back in excess after they got here and got their uh, colony established, and they were the most honorable people that God ever put on this continent. So they come here, and uh, Europe is a nightmare. It's a train wreck, and it's largely a wreck because of <clears throat> the centralization of government power. And government power was in the hands of kings and queens and church power was in the hands of a pope and cardinals, which is not even a scriptural office, either of those two. Cardinals are red bird from St. Louis, Louis, and a pope comes from Italian, means papa or father. And Jesus said, call no man father, for one is your father, even God. So that whole system was the train wreck that destroyed the Christian faith in the minds and hearts of the common people of Europe. And so they were plunged into a dark age situation where even learning and science and arts and everything stagnated because like this gentleman said, tyranny and religion and also tyranny and government. So the popes and the kings and queens are all in bed together and the whole idea is to extract money from the uh, poor middle class working people. If there was such a thing as a middle class, it was really a feudal system. And so this corruption finally got so bad that even men within the system began to cast it off in their minds and say this cannot be <clears throat> God's design for humanity. It cannot be. I mean, plagues, famines, uh, wars, uh, poverty, misery, human misery. It cannot be. And the reason it cannot be was because even those in the system, some of them knew that Christ had said, I am come that they might have life and life more abundant. And so the Middle Ages are a terrible time, and uh, the abundant life, if you would have said to them uh, something in regards to the abundant life being in the scriptures, they wouldn't have known what you were talking about, because their life was a drudgery and a misery. And the kings and dukes and barons and lords and duchesses and all of them lived on Easy Street and high on the hog, and the peasants are grinding out their lives supporting that nightmarish system. So the pilgrims washed their hands of both Protestantism and Catholicism. And they set sail for the unknown. And they come here not knowing what they would find, what they would expect, but they knew one thing. The entire European world was unfit for the gospel of Christ to even take root. And so they laid the foundation in their first governing document called the Mayflower Compact with their opening statement of that document says, in the name of God, amen. That's a huge clue as to why they came here. In the name of God, amen. And then it goes on to say, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, we the undersigned do hereby covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. The aforesaid ends. And what is that? It's in the name of God, amen. Glory of God advancement of the Christian faith. Those are the aforesaid ends. So they're the choicest people of the earth, persecuted unmercifully over in England. They finally fled to Holland. Their children in Holland began to pick up Scandinavian customs and corruption and sexual immorality. So they risked everything to come here and try to establish a place where God could be worshipped in spirit and in truth, where Christ was the head of the church and not a pope, and not a king, and not a queen. And to maybe someday even set up a decent form of government. All right, now in that Mayflower Compact, they lay the foundation for the Declaration of Independence, which is the character statement of the United States. And I want you to watch what happened. I didn't get to this in the last class. We'll try to get to it this time. What happened in the year 1776 is nothing short of a divine miracle, but it took blood, sweat, toil, and treasure and suffering to make it happen. But in a long history of man, if you want to go with the record that we have, is 4000 AD is roughly the creation. BC, AD time period, 
1000 AD, 2000 AD, all the way down here in 1776, somebody finally gets it right. Somebody finally does what's never been done. And what had never been done to that point is to go to the Word of God and just let's discover what will work. What does God say is right? How many branches should our government have? We know we've got to... We've got to decentralize the power rather than centralize it. We know we've got to do that, but how many branches? And what would those branches be called? And what would be their functions? And if you're a Bible student, you need to write this one down, and you need to highlight it in your Bible and even show it to your preacher and maybe wake him up a little bit, all right? And Isaiah 33, 22, out of the Word of God, is where we got the design and number and names of the branches of our federal government. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Judge is judicial. Lawgiver is legislative. That's what the Congress does. They make laws. King is executive. Lawgiver, judge, king is legislative, judicial, executive branches of our government. That's where it was founded. That's where that idea comes from. So it's all from Scripture. Now, in the year 1776, and I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this because uh, we've spit on all this, and we've decided we know better. And we've decided that, uh, that Christianity's bunk and uh, evolution's the truth. And uh, that means we had no plan or no design or no blueprint. And we all evolved from some polywog-like creature coming from a one-celled amoeba, which even the cells of that amoeba required 200 chemical compounds and proteins to come together at just the right temperature, humidity, moisture content, conditions. Everything had to be just perfect for even life to start with one cell. But... It happened, it just took millions and millions of years. Let me tell you what God says about that. <clears throat> There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Our nation is dying. The planet is being set on fire by evil. World financial systems are collapsing. China is rising and becoming the communist world superpower with nuclear capability. China just flew a stealth fighter this year that's almost a copy of our advanced tactical fighter because they've stolen all of our patents, all of our technology. They are rising. We are perishing. We're buying everything made in China. They've got the factories, the manufacturing, the cash, and they're building and expanding. They're the kings of the East and the Word of God and the Revelation that are going to come to Armageddon. It's that late. It's that late. But this idea of the centralization of government power and doing it without God's design, and saying that man is the end of all things, gets into high gear in the year 1776. It's not just our Declaration of Independence. It is, in a nutshell, it is Satan's end time plan to wreck and destroy humanity and continue to, as he has always done, try to exalt his throne above the stars of God. Isaiah 14. The Bavarian Illuminati, Bavaria being an earlier name for what is Germany, Bavarian Illuminati, Adam Weishaupt, by the way, Adam Weishaupt was a Jesuit priest that defected from Catholicism and decided, I'm not going to build a world government and empire through religion, I'm going to do it through corrupting governments and devising my own system. So, Weishaupt founds the Bavarian Illuminati. These people had a six-plank platform. Now, this happened, this, this platform was this charter. It was codified uh, May 1st of 1776. Declaration of Independence is July. They read it for the first time on the 2nd and signed it between the 2nd and 4th, but we'll call it July 4th because that's when we uh, celebrate, celebrate the holiday. So May 1st, <coughs> Satan puts his plan in high gear. July 4th, God puts his answer in place. These people sought to abolish private property. Now, we're close. Inheritance tax, we're close. Uh, eminent domain. Government comes in and says, we're moving you off your land, you're going to sell us your building, we're building a shopping center. Close. Abolition of private property, abolition of inheritance rights, that means when you die, everything goes to the stinking government. There's no future in that. Abolition of all sex laws and moral codes because it's survival of the fittest and man is his own god and, and if there is a god, it's man uh, recreating god in his own image. It's atheistic humanism. So they abolish anything that God ever said was right and wrong. So this abolishes basically the family. Abolition of patriotism to national states. 
abolition of all ordered government, except for theirs, of course. Worldwide antichrist atheistic regime is what they want. And abolition of all religion based on faith in God. Now, this six-plank platform was picked up on by Marx and Engels. And they revised and expanded the Charter of the Illuminati. These people were, they were run out of every country in Europe where their chapters were discovered. And they were a secret society underground. This is not some fictional book title you read about years ago by Larry Burkett writing about the Illuminati, although there was truth in his book. And this is a real organization that found it. So it went underground. Marx and Engels revitalized these six planks and expanded them to ten planks, and that became the planks of the Communist Manifesto in 1848. And uh, the basic nutshell of communism uh, is that there is no God and that the state is God. It's all about the collective greater good. Of course, you still have to have somebody leading the thing, so you've got the class of worker bees and the royalty. Again, it's a miserable situation. It leads to mediocrity, war, death, destruction. It's eventually going to lead to Antichrist, New World Order government. Revelation 13, the beast rising up out of the sea of politics. God counters this insanity that violates every principle that God ever delivered to us in his word so that we could have a decent life, so that we have the abundant life. And by the way, life is about God, faith, family, friends, and relationships. That's what it's about. That's my estimation. 57 years old. I was a Christ rejecter as a young person. I was a rock musician. I was a motocross racer. I was a destructive, foul-mouthed, little, stinking, ornery brat. Stealing from the shopping centers. Spent half my life fishing, building tree houses and burning them down, building dams in the creeks and ripping them through the neighborhood. We'd let dams and water build up for months and we'd go break the dams and Water would rip down through the neighborhood and tear up people's yards and gardens. I mean, that's the kind of piece of wreck I was, man. So I'm telling you this morning, I came from the other side of the spiritual spectrum, the other side of the political spectrum, and God Almighty put my head on straight finally when I was 23 and a half years old. I advise you to do it earlier. I advise you to hear the word of God as he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Because the day is coming when it will cost you your life to accept Christ right here in these states. And if you've already accepted him, it's probably going to cost us our lives at the edge of an Islamic sword when they take the place. If we don't experience repentance and revival. We're going to be annihilated probably by a combination of nuclear weapons from North Korea, Communist Red China, possibly the Russians. And Islamic terrorism blowing our guts out from sea to shining sea on the inside because we're too stupid to even do anything about such a vital matter as national security and our borders. We are out of our mind. And leftism is the damnation of the human race. And they, 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 just, they just can't see. No enemies, no real evil, no good and evil, no God. We'll fix it. We'll bail it out. We'll stimulate it. We'll create more jobs in the government sector so the private sector goes broke trying to support it. Yesterday we crossed $15 trillion of national indebtedness, by the way. That's irrecoverable. We're done. The dollar is finished on a world scale. Let's go through this side of the equation. By the way, this is left, okay? This is the root of leftism, where the government ends up running every aspect of your life. Providing your job, providing your health care. Welfare, food stamps, cheese, wick, anything, man, just gimme, 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 and we got half the population now that's on a government check, and I don't know if we can save this thing. I don't know if we can save it, because government is replacing our reliance on industry, ingenuity, self-effort, sweat, the work ethic, but ultimately, leftism and concentrated government that meets all your needs replaces God. God's being replaced by government because of damnable, God-hating, blasphemous leftism. And yes, I'm talking about the stinking National Democratic Party platform in this country and the executive branch of Barack Hussein Obama and the very idiocy of us electing somebody like that after 9-11. You have got to be kidding. We've almost collectively lost our mind. There was a ray of hope in 2010 
when the Republicans got the House back. But they've blown it in many instances too for a long time. And I'm not preaching the Republican Party to you this morning. But I am telling you, we're going to have a revival of godliness, decency, honor, integrity, common sense, the work ethic, the entrepreneurial spirit, and individual responsibility. We're going to have a revival of all of those things or we're done. And when we're done, human freedom is done. And when human freedom dies, the world is done. The human race is done. And that's how important saving what's left of America really is. All right, here's the right side of what happened in 1776. All right, first paragraph, Declaration of Independence, Laws of Nature, and of Nature's God. Did I, say, did I give you that first paragraph already, or was that the last class? Didn't get here yet? All right. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary, there was a necessity involved in declaring war against Great Britain, okay? It becomes necessary for one people, that's the colonies, to dissolve the political bands which had connected them with another, that's Great Britain. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impelled them to the separation. But in that paragraph they said, we are called to a separate and equal station by the laws of nature and of nature's God. So primary premise of the right side of what happened in 1776 that attempts to counter all of this atheistic government centralization, total power over people is the laws of nature and of nature's God. That's in the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. And by now the second paragraph begins, we hold these what? Okay. We're at a point where many millions of Americans don't even believe truth exists. Truth is relative. Morality is relative. What's good for you is good for you. Anything goes. But that's against our foundation. And it's against our future. And we're going to return to understanding what truth is or we're done. And this bunch in Washington has largely forsaken the concept that truth even exists. Therefore, they try this, try that, stimulus, bailout. Construction projects, shovel ready, blah, blah, blah. Anything but getting government regulations off the back of large and small business so they can actually hire people and produce a product. We've got such a hostile business environment in the United States now, I don't blame anybody for not starting any kind of endeavor because it's nearly impossible to do it. Blood-sucking lawyers, taxes, red tape, EPA, government regulations. It's created a hostile business environment, and that's why everything's leaving. Lawyers. And Jesus said, woe unto you lawyers, you've cast away the key of knowledge. Well, the key of knowledge is the word of God. Love and money is the root of all evil. Corporations selling out the American worker to go do it cheaper somewhere else. It's all coming home to roost. And it's all rooted in lust and greed and power and control and profit. It's all, it's all in the heart of man. And that's why we've got to have a revival of all these things we mentioned and we're done. We're done. Second paragraph, Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths, as you said, to be what? Self-evident. What does that mean? What does self-evident mean? What's a, what's, a, what's a synonym for self-evident? Obvious. Who said that? A for the day. That's right. Exactly right. That means obvious to the most casual observer. Kind of like the fact that there was a creator of the universe. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day after day they utter speech, night after night they teach knowledge. And there is no people, nor land, nor voice where they are not heard. That's a self-evident truth. It ought to be if you're thinking. If you ever look at the night sky in the darkness of a rural community and look at the night sky, the heavens declare the glory of God. That's one example of a self-evident truth. What did they say, though? Self-evident truth number one. They presuppose the creator. All men are created equal. They are endowed. What is an endowment? What's an endowment? Obligation. Huh? Obligation. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's a little bit different than that. It's, it's something you convey to somebody, but it's not a name. It's a positive. The national endowment. What's that? That's right. Exactly right. So they're endowed by their creator. With what? Unalienable rights. <coughs> so the creator is presupposed by this side. The creator is denied by leftism. 
So, all men are created equal. They are endowed by the Creator. That means given by the Creator. What? Certain unalienable rights. What are some of them? Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It says, among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Not limited to, but here's a few of them. Here's a few of the important ones. Life. Life. God breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And the pursuit of happiness. Somebody tell me what the word pursuit means. To seek. Hmm? To seek. Yeah. Yeah. Another word for pursuit is to go after it. To chase after it. And it involves some sweat and effort. Some labor. Skin in the game, as they say these days. The pursuit of happiness is not a government paycheck. Government is not the author of human happiness. God's design of understanding who you are and I am in God's universe in relation to Him. That is the root of human happiness. So these are some of the unalienable. What does unalienable mean? Look right in the middle of unalienable, and there's the word lean. This is, a, this is an accounting term, a legal term, to put a lien against something. If you put a lien against somebody's house or property, they don't really own it until the lien is taken away. So you can think of this as they are not lienable by anybody but God because he endowed gave them, bequeathed them unto us. So the pursuit of happiness represents the work ethic. You go after it. What is the purpose of government according to the founders? The second paragraph goes on to say that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's why we get to vote. That's why in Europe it was such a train wreck. There's no election in Europe. There's no voting in, in Europe pre-America. It was the divine right of kings. It was hereditarily transferred to the next heir to the throne that might be a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old son if the king dies early or gets assassinated. But that's how the power went down. The people never had a voice. And I guarantee you, when the little youngsters were put on the throne and crowned king, and they were, guess who's doing the advising? Oh, the uncles and cousins and grandfathers are doing the advising, you see. And it's all in the family, and it's all this nightmare of centralized control. And the people never having a voice. This is leftism. That's their goal. That's what they had. That's why we came here to get away with it. And the American Revolution shattered forever the <coughs> false idea of the divine right of kings, that they had absolute rule, that their rule and their decisions could not be questioned by the common man, and you submit or go to the tower or the prison or the scaffold. So this is part of the reason we say that America is a miracle in human history, that after all this time, somebody finally gets it right, and they get it right with a God-centered worldview versus a godless, atheistic center worldview. Now, who are some of the superstars that come down on this side of the equation? They are Marx and Engels, of course. They are Stalin. They are Hitler. They are Mussolini. They are Pol Pot, the Cambodian killing field murderous nightmarish guy. Mao Zedong. I mean, they are the butchers of the human race in their lust and quest for power and world domination. It's insane. That's what leftism represents. It's the damnation of the human race. The right side leads to a decent, stable, prosperous, safe, sane, industrious <coughs> nation that blesses the world with advancements in technology because of the excess money generated by capitalism. If you hate capitalism and you're part of the Wall Street crowd, you're an enemy of your own future and you're an enemy of the future of the human race. Because when we're done as a nation, human freedom is done. And when freedom dies, life's not worth living. Because it's the rulers and the peasants. And the rulers, falling for the strong delusion of 2 Thessalonians 2, that there can actually be peace on earth without the Prince of Peace, will submit and follow the Antichrist.
And so this is where it's all headed. So this side leads to an Antichrist New World Order, human suffering, death, war, and misery. This side leads to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness based on the Creator's design. And because our founders, and earlier than them the Puritans, 1630s, and earlier than them the Pilgrims, 1620, and earlier than them the Protestant reformers that began to break the stranglehold of Romanism and the power of kings, and going back to the Word of God and saying, this can't be right, there's got to be something better. See, that train of God-centered thinking has allowed you to live in this country. But the best food the world has to offer, freedom to travel state to state, no papers, clothing, shelter, education, recreation, anything you want. You can do it here, you can have it all here. But we can't forget where it came from. And that is the crux issue that we have been involved in for quite some time. I want to read you a piece of, uh, a piece of history that really kind of captures in a nutshell our current situation again. And this was spoken in 1863. But uh, Abraham Lincoln captured, he captured a proper view of all these blessings this bounty. He said, and of course being 1863, that's right in the middle of the war between the states, 61 to 65. And so he issues a proclamation for National Day of Fasting, Humiliation, and Prayer because the nation is at war against itself, brother killing brother, north against south. He says, we have been recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity, we have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace, multiplied and enriched us, and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom of our own. Now catch this and consider where we are today. Intoxicated with unbroken success. We have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of preser preserving and redeeming grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and pray for clemency and forgiveness. We're at a point where we're going to have a revival of our founding principles, of constitutional thought, of godliness, decency, the work ethic, individual responsibility, we're going to revive these principles in our country, or we're going to be crushed and finished and done. And then freedom goes, and then what makes life worth living goes. And then Christ comes back and judges this world and its kings and its rulers and its tyrants and the wicked. And then the millennial kingdom sets in. When finally the lion will lay down with the lamb and there will not be war anymore. And all the things that we think we want, the peace that we want, the comfort that we want, the best things of life that we can conjure up in our minds, that's when they will ultimately come to pass. But you won't experience those things if you uh, decide to live your life outside of God's design. If you think he's a joke, if you think the Bible's a hoax and a myth like I did, hey, listen, man, listen. When I was 16 and a half years old, I had been dragged to church kicking and screaming my whole young life. And I finally got to where I thought I knew it all and the parents are crazy and I was in rebellion against my teachers, against law enforcement, against authority, store clerks, you name it. And I was going to do things my way, not knowing that God said there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I was going to do it my way. And I spent from 16 to 23 and a half years old uh, doing my thing, and all those things I described to you earlier, all, the, all those hellish things. And God finally put my head on straight after I got out of high school, went to junior college, got two associate degrees, and entered the workplace. And finally, <coughs> all the neat things about high school or college years, and, you know, whether it's frats or sports or music or concerts or friends and parties, you know, whatever it was, you know, all that stuff kind of 
heads way back on the back burner when you have to grind out the living and pay the bills. And I found myself in a situation of uh, finally realizing I didn't have the answers to everything. And uh, honestly asking myself, uh, you know, what, what is it really all about? I mean, are we just... Are we just a gigantic ant farm, you know, being overseen by some invisible God? I mean, is it just a big experiment? Or is there a greater meaning and a deeper purpose to the whole thing? And I started questioning these things. And so, because all the friends were gone. See, all the friends were gone, and, and, and the parties were gone, and, and, and away from home, and, and term papers, and, and studying, and tests, and all that stuff, you know. I said, Lord, there's got to be more to it than this. So I got that entry-level job, raced motocross. Motocross was my God. But when the races were rained out or the, the bike needed parts I couldn't afford, my pleasure was gone. My purpose for living was gone. It all just evaporated. And I started asking myself on long, lonely, rainy nights, God, what's it all about? Is there a greater purpose? And I didn't find it until I was 23 and a half years old. And the United States Navy had given me a little green Gideon New Testament. For the first time in my life, I shut my stinking, blasphemous, rebellious mouth long enough to start investigating what does God have to say about life. And I may have said this at the beginning, but let me say it again. Life is about God, faith, family, friends, and relationships. And for me and a bunch of us, it's still about the country as well. There's a great question in this, uh, in this old, old book. It used to be in school libraries, a book on patriotism. Probably no such thing anymore. But it says this about love of God and love of country. There's a question posed here, and this was my question, and this is your question. What are we doing for time? We have 14 minutes. Okay, get your questions ready. I'm going to read you this, and then I'll probably cover one more thing and then, and then shut up. <clears throat> it sometimes seems that patriotism or good citizenship is the virtue that includes all others. The question, what is the chief end of man? That's what I was asking myself at 23. What is it really all about? Am I a hamster in a cage? Am I destined to pay bills and support the light company, power company, water company, all the other bills, and just grind to powder, maybe be successful, maybe not, and die and rot in the ground? Is that what it's all about? So they ask the question here, what is the chief end of man? To which the catechism gives the solemn and sublime answer to glorify God and enjoy him forever. This answer comes back to every generation that has risen above the beast. The beast is the sin nature in man. It may turn out that there will be only two answers. One is the answer given by our Puritan ancestors to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. The other answer is the beast's answer, which the beast in man gives well knowing its meaning. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Here's the question. Life for the glory of God or life for the indulgence of self? Between these two, the youth are to take their choice. I'll tell you what. We lived... For the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and missionary endeavor and outpouring, foreign aid, disaster relief, even fighting wars and defending people that we didn't speak their language, we didn't live where they lived, pouring it out of this country, securing human freedom for the human race on a continual basis during the 20th century. Nobody has ever done what we've done. No one else could have done what we've done. First World War, 116,000 American dead soldiers. Second World War, 430,000 plus. Korea, 53,000. Vietnam, 58,000. War on terror, now thousands and thousands. Nobody else does it. You know why nobody else does it? Oh, they try, they help a little bit here and there, but when the going gets tough, they all back out. And it's down to us now. It's down to us and Israel to stop militant Islam from turning the world into a nuclear firestorm of destruction and death. And under Obama, it's not going to happen. We're not going to stop Iran. You're going to see nuclear war in the Middle East in the next few years. You are there. You're going to see it. And when that happens, everything goes to hell. When that happens, Iran and Israel tie up oil gas, not three, not four, not five, maybe ten dollars a gallon plus. You know what happens when that happens? American economy, American economy completely shuts down. When that happens, people will be killing each other over what's in your kitchen cabinets and what's left in your refrigerator if the power grid is even still on to run your refrigerator. We're going under judgment because we have spit in the face 
of the righteous God, who is the author of human freedom. Let me cover this. What we got? Eight nine minutes? Um, Eleven. Oh, hot dog! All right, I got a minute. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm capable of laughing. I want you to know that. <laughs> no, I do. I good time. All right. Post World War II. Now look, look, look. We saved the world in the Second World War. From who? The what? What's it called? The three powers. What's it called? Axis. Who said it? A couple of you said it. Good, good. Axis power. And they were? Germany? Germany? Exactly right. For sure. For sure. All right. So we saved the world again. We, we basically saved it from further destruction in World War I because we tipped the scales back in favor of human freedom versus tyranny. We got in later. Thank God we got in to the meat grinder that was World War I. Second World War, we came home. Top of the world. We forgot the God who made us, like he said. Intoxicated with unbroken success. Too proud to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God that made us. It's exactly what we've gone through since the Second World War. The fifties are characterized by materialism. We came home. The depression years are gone. The war years are gone. It's okay to have blessings in the abundant life, but you can't forget where it came from. And we started forgetting. And the 60s were characterized by rebellion and the invasion of the Beatles and back in the USSR and LSD, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and Strawberry Fields Forever and all of that rebellious communistic crap that came out of those little four Beatle-headed rock stars. 60s, rebellion, sex, drugs, rock and roll. The 70s was a sexual revolution. This is when marriage began to fall apart. Watch in 73, Roe versus Wade. Our Supreme Court declares war on the untoward child. You know what God thinks about the shedding of innocent blood? He hates it. Proverbs 6. Six things are abomination unto him. Yea, seven. Six things doth the Lord hate. Seven are abomination unto him. Number one, proud look. Number two, a lying tongue. Number three, hands that shed innocent blood. Feet that be swift in running to mischief, a heart that deviseth evil imaginations. All kinds of things there, but number three is the shedding of innocent blood God hates. So we declare the war on the unborn child here, and it also says the land is defiled by the shedding of innocent blood. And America is cursed from this point forward, and we're still doing it. AIDS, homosexual revolution. Now, what God says about sexual relations and morality and the purpose of the family and the purpose of the beautiful, fantastic sensations that exist in the sexual relationship between husband and wife, man and woman, this now gets perverted. The 90s are dominated by political correctness, but, but notice in 62, this all gets into high gear because we pitch God in the early 60s. See, materialism sets in, we forget God, the rebellious spirit... I'll do it my way. Do your own thing. Uh, values are not clear. Uh, morality is relevant. Truth doesn't exist. And so we throw God out of the public schools. Leads to the sexual revolution, breakdown of the family, sexual morality gets perverted. And through the 90s, we're dominated by this thing called political correctness where you're not allowed to offend anybody. You go to jail for offending somebody. By 2000, we've lost all common sense. And 9-11-2001... God comes in and just says, Pow! Using a faraway foreign power that we knew nothing about to slap us down and strike terror into the hearts of the nation. That is called chastisement. That is called discipline. And even after that, we elect a guy that was born to a Muslim father who has a forged birth certificate, who has a social security number that was stolen from a dead guy in the state of Connecticut by a relative of his that works in the passport office in Hawaii. And the last thing I'll tell you, and then I'll take questions. This president is not only illegitimate, he is the most despicable piece of human political garbage that has ever disgraced the halls of government in the United States of America. And he hates capitalism. He hates business, large and small. He hates the middle class, just like Karl Marx hated the business owners. He's doing nothing about national security. In fact, he's suing the governor of Arizona for trying to do something about her borders. 
And he's all about illegal immigration and legal immigration. He's all about letting everybody flood in here because the secret is out that if you got a leftist administration, you're going to get bennies from the public treasury. And so just keep voting Democrat, and they'll take care of you from the cradle to the grave. The secret is out. And leftism is the damnation of human freedom. It's the damnation of the human race. This is where we are with this nightmare president. And we're going to turn, and we're going to change, or we're going to be done. It's an unbelievable thing that we've done. We got a little bit of ray of hope in 2010 when we took back and got at least some stopping power to the Marxist communist freight train that is destroying our founding principles and has wrecked our economy now to the tune of $15 trillion. And by the way, that $15 trillion has been accumulated over about 235 years or so, and $5 trillion of it has been accumulated since Nancy Pelosi became leftist Democrat Speaker of the House and Obama was elected. A third of the entire nation's historical national debt has been created in the last four years. God help us. We're destroyed. The dollar's finished. You better get used to living with less, having a harder time finding a job if you find one at all. And let me say this, and then I'll shut up. If you think you're going to go to college and take on $50,000 worth of college loan debt and then go out there and just waltz into a high-paying job, you're out of your mind. And I'm going to tell you what. If you can walk into a family business right now, if you've got some, some family thing going on that you can make a living at, I would advise you strongly to give that a shot. Give it a year or two. Work with your family. Work in the family business. Do something local and watch what's going to happen to this economy because you do not want to strap on $50,000 worth of debt. There are people walking the streets by the millions now with all kinds of education and you'll be competing against them with all of their prior business experience and they can't even get hired. Don't take it on without a lot of thought. If you're going to take it on, here's what you better be. Best of the best. Cream of the crop. Top of the class. That's the only prayer you'll have of getting a job. But if you're not ready to work and sweat and present yourself properly and be the best in this country among young people, you don't have a chance. Think about it hard. I'm going to shut up. Questions now. Anything goes. Anything. Yes, sir. So are you saying that... Um in regards to 9-11, that God used the sins of other people to punish us, or he used the sins of those who attacked us. He forced them as part of his chastisement. Now, I'm not one that says that he actively formed the plan, put it in their hearts and minds, directed it and all that. In, in the Word of God, there is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Good will of God, perfect will of God, acceptable will of God. The sovereign God of the universe could have stopped that thing. The sovereign God of the universe caused a Japanese aircraft to have an engine problem at the Battle of Midway that caused them to take off two hours late that would have flown directly over one of our strike forces at Midway and they would have wiped us out. Another one of those planes spotted our other task force going to engage them at Midway and his radio malfunctioned. There are sovereign acts of God in history. The trout swam up, the salmon and trout swam upstream to feed the soldiers of Valley Forge in the wintertime, which has never happened again in human history. There are sovereign acts of God. So I'm saying about 9-11, God allowed that thing to happen because of 50 years of America's gradual mass rebellion against his design. Because... The Word of God says, to whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And we have been blessed, protected, and prospered like no other nation in world history. But we've spit on the God and his truth that is the author of all of those blessings. That, that's my take on it. That's my view on it, actually. And even in the Old Testament, I mean, God used the Assyrians, God used the Egyptians, God used the Babylonians to even chastise his own people. I estimate this thing to be one final chastising slap in the face to try to awaken us to our own slipping and sliding in the moral depravity in every area that we might seek his face and repent. I don't know how many of you know this great promise, but the greatest promise in the word of God that we, we need to grab hold of today is in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, and I hope some of you have heard that verse before, but here's the ultimate solution for us to survive as a nation. God says there, 2 Chronicles 7, chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name, there's conditions here. 
God's not waiting for the news media anchors that hate him to repent. He's not waiting for even the politicians to repent. He says, if my people, God's waiting for his people, Christian people, God-fearing people, people that love God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, if my people who are called by my name will do four things, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God promises three things. He says, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins. And we'll heal their land. Our land's being destroyed. We need a healing. It's in our hands to do so. It's God's promise. Yes, sir. Are you saying that if the news media, yada, yada, all those people did repent, God would turn them away? Oh, no. I'm just saying to save the nation, the promise is to if my people, it's to his people, and God's people are the believers in him. You know, So it's really on the church is what I'm saying. It's on the church, and our preachers are in Disneyland. Our preachers are out of it. I don't blame people for not being able to find a decent church. I mean, it's not about fun and games and campuses and sports and recreation and covered dish suppers. It's about God's truth, and we're perishing for lack of knowledge. Hosea 4 6. I gotta shut up. Love you guys. I wish you a good future. Thank you. By the way, what was your reason for taking the class? You hear a lot of cool stories from other people in the past. Cool stories. Mm -hmm. Nut jobs coming in, crying, frothing, spitting, going crazy on the grease board, man. Amen. Yeah, all that stuff. I was going to say the same thing. Okay. <laughs> it's a blast, right? Polyrad's a blast, right? That's, that's, that's a lot of reason. Do you have something? Anybody else? Because Mr. Lawson is wonderful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good life. Is it easy grade? You get graded? They get graded. They get graded. My goodness, man. We all better ask some questions and perk up. All right. I'll leave you now, Polyrad's a cool thing. It's a neat concept. It, uh, I don't know if it's going on anywhere else in the country. I hope you look at this. I hope you look at this uh, as a really unique privilege. I hope you look at it as a blessing. Um, because you're being exposed to the whole spectrum of ideas before you leave the comforts of home. Before you leave the environment where you see your friends every day and, you know, senior time is neat, you know, and uh, most of your bills are paid, your, your needs are met, car payment, insurance, I mean, whatever it is, food, clothing, shelter, the necessities of life, I mean, it's a pretty, pretty neat time. And uh, you can experience some of that in college, but it gets tougher. And then when you enter the workplace, I'm going to tell you, things really change, okay, and that's when reality sets in. So. Part of my motivation for teaching Polyrad is to, uh, to help you to not only be exposed to these ideas, but decide what you believe. And get yourself a set of foundational core principles before you leave this neat, fun, provided for environment. Before you leave this stage in your life that's pretty secure right now. Uh, get yourself a set of core principles. All right. And one thing is, what are you going to use as your standard for right and wrong? What is going to be the basis or platform from which you operate for your conduct? College, workplace, world sports, whatever. I mean, what's your decision-making anchor? And so I want to tell you that uh, I don't come to bear bad news on purpose, but you're living in a world that's gone mad, okay? And you're going to go into the workplace, and if you've got any spiritual convictions so far, you're going to go to sensitivity training, and they're going to try to beat all of that out of you, and they're going to threaten you with being fired if you voice your Christian convictions or your racial convictions or patriotic convictions or any other kind of conviction that you have just about. I mean, PC is in full swing in the workplace. And so it's a tough field. If you go to the college world, you're going to have... Uh, high-minded academics that think they're the gods of the human race, and uh, they're going to try to wreck you. If you believe in what I believe life is about, if you believe in God, faith, family, friends, and relationships, and by the way, that's what I think life is about, you can jot those down and just keep them for future reference because you're going to need them. That's what it's about. But 
You'll have college professors that if you're a creationist, he's going to try to destroy you. <coughs> and if you're on the right side of the political spectrum, uh, your political science professor is probably going to be a leftist nut job that's going to tell you Marx and Engels had it right, they just didn't perfect it and we need to keep trying the communism. I mean, you're going you're gonna to have your brains like uh, Hillary Clinton during a congressional inquiry. I can't remember. My brain's in a blender. Okay. <coughs> Uh, they're going to try to do that to you. They're going to try to scramble your brains, wreck your convictions, and turn you into their little molded pupilite that's going to go out and do in society what they think uh, young people should do. So uh, that especially applies to those of you that may have uh, strong convictions about God and the Bible and the gospel and creation. So just stand by for that, but you need core principles. I didn't get mine until I was 23 and a half, okay? And I was a little monstrous brat as a young person. And so what I tell you this morning is not coming from a brainwashed perspective of always being in church and always being in Sunday school and this is the way it is and I never had a choice. It's not like that at all. In fact, I, I rebelled for seven full long years. I rebelled against everything. I turned our house into a living hell on Sunday morning fighting my parents over not going to church. And I did what I wanted to do with my friends, and I finally graduated high school, making C's and D's and incompletes, and went to junior college and made C's and D's and F's again. It took longer than I should have to get through that, and then I joined the Navy, because the workplace was for the birds. And so uh, I had quite a, quite a past there of rejecting everything that I'll share with you today. So uh, it doesn't come from prior programming. It comes from the School of Hard Knocks and giving the Word of God a chance in my life. And if I, if I had somebody walk through the door right now and say, I'm going to blow your brains out, you got five seconds to say the last thing you're going to say to this classroom, here's what I'd tell you. Give God a chance in your young life before you make the decision to consciously reject Him. You are not experienced enough, old enough, wise enough. You had not been through the meat grinder of this wicked world enough yet. You haven't experienced it yet. You're not yet qualified to make the decision to totally cast God and faith and the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ out of your thinking and out of your life. Don't do it. I beg you don't do it. And God put my head on straight at 23 and a half. After, after, we came within a few feet of water under the Atlantic Ocean of our American nuclear submarine sinking. And I was a lost kid, lost as a goose. And after I would had a motorcycle wreck on a Sunday night on the way back to junior college, laying half unconscious in a road with an oncoming car, and a guy jumped out of a Plymouth Roadrunner and grabbed me by a collar and grabbed my motorcycle by the other collar and slung us both into the ditch just before that car rushed by and would have ground me to eternity in hell. And God spared me till I was 23 and a half to seek Him and finally figure out what life's about. And uh, I'm telling you, your, your world is insane. Your country is being destroyed. Your future is ominous. All of our futures are ominous now. There is nothing certain about next year, next month, maybe even next week. America has been the greatest blessing among nations to the nations of the world it's ever been. We've provided more foreign aid, more disaster relief, more help in time of trouble. Our soldiers have fallen from foreign skies. They've died on foreign fields. They've died in prison camps of the Chinese and the Germans and everybody else and the, just the Axis powers. I mean, our soldiers have done it all for others than ourselves, preserving human freedom. You know why? Because we used to be a Christian nation. We used to believe what God said about everything. And we used to have a creed that the Bible states that says, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. We laid down our life for people we've never seen before, don't speak their language, never been to their country, and we have laid it down and shelled it out and given it and loaned it and just poured out of this country because of our gospel foundation, because of our Christian world view that we were founded upon that we used to have. And all of the calamities and tragedies that are happening nowadays, I hope you're keeping up with them. 
I hope you understand what the, uh, I mean, I hope you can fathom this number of $15 trillion of national indebtedness means. I mean, the number's just almost too big. I mean, it's a stack of $100 bills that goes to the moon and back. It, it, you can't even fathom that number hardly, but that's where it is. Our leftist shift in the last four years has created almost $5 trillion of the debt of the entire country. You know why? Because the democratic national platform is Marxist socialist leaning towards communism, where government replaces the provision of God and your own ability to provide for yourself, which is the pursuit of happiness in our Declaration of Independence. The pursuit of happiness is not a welfare check, it's not a government aid program. It's a pursuit you chase after it, you go after it. So you get an education, you apply yourselves, you learn, you study, you go to that job interview, you present yourself in the best way possible, you learn how to read and write and spell and spell check your own job resume with something other than the computer because it doesn't pick up on homonyms. T-O-O, T-O, T-H-E-I-R, T-H-E-R-E, those are homonyms. And you'll look like an idiot on a job interview resume if you don't... Uh, proofread everything you submit to someone you're trying to get a job for. So all of us, all of it is collapsing. And uh, I told the last class, and I, I have the thought on my mind, I'll tell you right now, don't even think about going out there and going to college and strapping on $40,000, $50,000 worth of student loan debt and think you're going to waltz into a high-paying entry-level position when you get out of college in four years. Because I'm here to tell you, <coughs> life as we know it may not be around in four years. America as a world superpower, as the world superpower, we not, may not be the superpower in less than two years. China is becoming the world superpower. Islam has taken the governments of Europe by sheer fear and terror attacks and intimidation. England, our mother country, is collapsing under the weight of Islam. They bombed a train in Madrid, Spain a few years ago to turn a presidential election from conservative to liberal. They bombed the London subway buses a few years ago, scaring them to death. So London, England now has a 40% Islamic population and courts of Sharia law in England, which is Islamic law that none of you ladies would, would live under. You, 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 you think you don't have rights, you think you're oppressed in America, you don't know what oppression is. You better investigate Sharia law because it's coming. It's already creeping into our financial system. These are things that are going on around the world. I hope you're paying attention to them. The greatest, the greatest peril we face is an executive branch that hates capitalism and hates America's superpower status and is destroying the middle class and is in love with the environment and Mother Earth rather than Father God and could care less about the unborn child while we save mosquitoes, whales, and the snail dart or fish and spotted owls. And their thinking is skewed. It's lost. It's insanity. And they're plunging our nation towards certain death and destruction. You're going to see amazing things in your young life here very shortly. Make your decisions wisely. I've got a 10 point outline that uh, I'm going to breeze over. I didn't get over to either of the other two classes. I'm going to breeze over it very quickly, and then you'll get a copy of this uh, in the days to come. Make your notes. Uh, read this before you write your final review on me, okay? Read this whole thing, because I can't cover this whole thing today. It's just grown over the years, and it's become too much. Point number one is that spiritual concepts matter. It matters what you think about good and evil, right and wrong, truth versus error, and whether or not there's a God or a devil, and whether you're created or evolved. I mean, all these things, spiritual concepts matter. Bad decisions can have long-term consequences. I probably don't need to tell you that. But one night of pleasure, one dare from some empty air-headed friend to do something stupid that you know is stupid, that you know you might get hurt, you might get injured, one bad decision can change your life. As my best friend in my high school graduating class in 1972, I lost him to him becoming a vegetable after he smashed his head 
on a signpost at 50 miles an hour in a curve because those geniuses went car surfing on graduation night. And my friend Paul Piazza that I played Little League Baseball with, we played flag football, we played, we built tree houses, we did everything together all the way through my high school years. And he was turned into a, a four-year-old vegetable that when I went to visit him my senior year after moving to South Carolina, I got through my senior year down there. I went to the graduation party of my old class in Wilmington, Delaware. And then Paul wasn't there. I went to see Paul. And his mother told me, he probably won't remember you. He had an act. I said, oh, Paul will remember me. Oh, come on. What do you mean? We, we, she said, just, he probably won't remember you. He's up at St. Catherine's parking lot shooting basketball. And I was 18, 19, and so was he. And uh, I'll never forget going up to that parking lot. And uh, he's out there shooting the ball. And he saw me coming and walking. And uh, he turned and looked at me and just kept bouncing the ball and took another shot. And just, I got closer. He didn't, no recognition. I got right up to him, tapping him on the shoulder. And he just kind of looked at me with a blank stare, like that, that stare that just there's nothing going on in there. And I said, Paul, Paul, it, it's Brad, man. Remember? Tree houses, Little League. Turnstone Drive, you lived over in Brookmead? I mean, and he stuttered and said, I, I, I ha had an accident. My best friend, what am I saying? Bad decisions can have long-term consequences. I've never gotten over that my whole life. That I lost my best friend to one moment of making a bad choice. Freedom is predicated upon righteousness, number three. Freedom is based on the righteousness of God. God is the author of liberty. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Guess what? Where the Spirit of the Lord is not, there is tyranny. The Word of God says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The opposite of that verse is, Cursed is the nation whose God is not the Lord. And these are things historically proven. America's success is all rooted in a proper understanding by our Protestant Reformation through the pilgrims to the Puritans to the colonies, to the Declaration of Independence, a covenant relationship with God for our daily bread, our subsistence, our families, lives, communities, our workplace, our military, our government, law, courts, justice. Everything hinges on God's righteousness. So point three is freedom is predicated. That means based upon God's righteousness. Number four, leftism is the damnation of the human race. Leftism. And we'll go into what leftism is and what their legacy and heritage is. Number five, United Nations. Many people think the United Nations is the last best hope for mankind. I'll tell you right now, the United Nations is the nuts and bolts structure of a world government without God. It's going to form the nuts and bolts of the end time reign of the Antichrist. It is not a friend of the United States. Its treaties are binding. We should have never put it on American soil. And the Rockefeller family donated the land and the first $5,000 to build that modern-day Tower of Babel, and they are destroying our sovereignty treaty by treaty. Number six, Islam is not a sweet little sister religion to Christianity, but is rather an ideology that has been at war against human freedom for 1,400 years. So just under that one, just write, Islam is a long-term problem. It's not going away. And the peril is... We're deaf, dumb, and blind in our understanding of it in the halls of government. And what's even worse, most preachers haven't bothered to investigate this thing that is driving the world to Armageddon. So they can't inform their people. We don't know what we're dealing with. And they are taking the world by storm. 9-11 was the beginning of the global jihad that's going to drive us to Armageddon. It wasn't the end. It was the beginning. All right, number seven. Now, this is where I used to stop the outline. Years ago, I only had seven points. I like doing things in sevens because it's a nice pattern. God did lots of things in sevens. Created the earth. Six days and rested on the seventh. The millennium is going to be the Sabbath of rest. This is 6,000 years of human history. Roughly 4,000 B.C. was the creation. The cross is the crossroads of human history. A.D. 2000, we're a little bit past that, but that's 6,000 years, and we're on the verge of the millennium of rest, the seventh period of 1,000 years. God does lots in sevens. The priests at Jericho, when they conquered Jericho, they marched around the walls. 
uh, seven times and blew seven trumpets on the seventh day, those walls fell in. I mean, it's just amazing symbolism of the number seven. So I used to have seven points, but seven used to be America, with all of her faults, all of her frequent political mistakes, and even with all of her sins, is still worth saving. So you get just number seven. America, with all of her faults, is still worth saving. And is still the best place on God's earth to grow up, get an education, live, work, raise a family, pursue a dream of any place else on earth. I went to Bible College down south and uh, preaching a hard sermon on the sins of America one day. I, I made the statement. I made the statement that uh, I'm never going to live under a UN flag. I'm never going to deny the Lord. And this lady said to me after the service, she said, well, Brad, where are you going to go? If you're not going to live under a UN flag and the world government's coming, where are you going to go? I said, I'm not leaving. She said, what? <laughs> you don't want to live under Antichrist UN rule, but you're not leaving. So I said, did it ever occur to you that uh, resistance to tyrants is obedience to God? <laughs> I'll stay and fight. You couldn't, you couldn't pay me 10 gazillion, billion, trillion dollars not to leave this country and live anywhere else on earth. No place better to do all the things that we think makes life worth living. Number eight, nuclear Iran and Israel's dilemma. We're in a place now of weakness. Iran is going nuclear. There are two major divisions in the Islamic faith, Sunnis and Shiites. The Sunnis are majority... Many of them we can actually deal with and trade with to a point, but the Shiites are something else. And Iran is Persian Shiite and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Are you all familiar with the name? Are you paying attention on the news? Do you know who I'm talking about? Ahmadinejad. Okay, some of you do. All right, those of you that do, clue everybody else in. All right, he is what we would equate with the president of Iran. He's not the supreme leader. The spiritual ayatollahs are the supreme leaders, but we'll just call him president of Iran. He uh, is the madman of planet Earth. He is lying and deceiving the UN committee, the, the atomic energy branch of the United Nations, investigating his nuclear program. Uh, they've been building their nuclear program for probably 20, 25 years. And they are within months of having a deliverable nuclear weapon that will be delivered to Tel Aviv, Israel. And uh, we're in a position of now, the Chinese and the Russians won't even help us with any further sanctions. But sanctions will not stop uh, their dreams. And so the problem with Islam is... And that's one of, my, one of my points. Islam is not the sweet little sister religion, but it's been at war against human freedom and civilization for 1,400 years. Well, now they're going nuclear. Now, Ahmadinejad sees himself as the appointed servant of Allah to bring about the world chaos in which conditions the Quran says that the Islamic <coughs> Messiah will return. Only in the time of extreme chaos and turmoil. So what I'm telling you is they have their own version of the second coming. It has the element of chaos and world destruction incorporated in it. And Ahmadinejad sees himself as the self-appointed political leader to bring about the chaos so Islam can rule the world through what's called the 12th Imam. And the Imam... Is there going to be their supreme little prophet teacher that supposedly is going to come back and rule? Well, I mean, that means nuclear war in the Middle East. That means your loaf of bread goes from uh, two bucks to seven bucks. That means gas goes from five bucks a gallon. It's going to go to 10, 15, 20. It's going to crush us. We'll be done. If the Iranians stop up the Strait of Hormuz over there, that all of the oil, 67% of the world's oil, comes out of this narrow geographical turning point in the canal over there called the Strait of Hormuz. If they stop that up and attack it and make ships impassable, there's no telling where oil is going to go, and they will do anything to destroy America and destroy Israel. Because Israel, in their mind, is the little Satan. America is the great Satan. This is where we are, and it could happen just any day. By the way, China 
flew their first stealth fighter in an air show earlier this year. Our CIA and intelligence and defense people <coughs> thought that China was five years away from having a stealth aircraft. And they just flew the thing. Like in September, October, they flew the thing already. And it's a copy of one of our most advanced stealth tactical fighters. Now this is the world we're living in. Nuclear Iran and Israel's dilemma. Here's the dilemma. America's not going to do anything about it. Because Obama <coughs> is a pro-Palestinian, pro-Islamic, born to a Muslim father, weak leftist on military matters who doesn't value Israel's survival. He is a real mixed bag, and the Word of God says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. President Obama is making shipwreck of your future, America's future, and therefore the world's future. So Israel's dilemma is they're going to have to do it on their own because we're not going to do it. We're not going to help it. If Israel strikes Iran, Russia, and Syria, and China come in on the side of Iran. It means World War III in the Middle East. It means Armageddon is at the doorstep. That's what it means. Number nine, the Obama administration. I'll just read you this one. Socialist, communist nightmare. All right. Most Americans know something is terribly wrong. They can't quite put their finger on it. The communist revolution is going on before our eyes at the highest levels of our federal government. There are now 32 czars. A czar is an unelected policymaker, handpicked and chosen by the president to lead a federal advisory panel or board or committee and advise him on the course of the nation. They are the very embodiment of the dreams of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, authors of the Communist Manifesto, 1848. Obama's appointees, as well as himself, here's what the left is, young people, here's what we have elected to run the, run the greatest nation on earth. Despise capitalism, hate business, they see more government as the only solution to every problem. Capitalism is the engine of America's prosperity and financial power status. Business provides jobs, government ruins everything it gets its hands on. The government is filled with alphabet soup agencies like the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, or the, uh, the, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, or the Department of Energy, or Department of Defense, or Department of the Interior, or the, the Post Office. I mean, just about every federal department is failing in its mission. The Post Office is running a $10 billion deficit by the end of this year. The Department of Energy, we have a non-energy policy. We have hundreds of years of our own oil in the wilderness lands of Alaska, but because of the deer and the moose and the caribou, we won't drill for our own oil because we're so stupid that we have rejected Father God that put the resources under our land mass, and we've decided to worship Mother Earth and not disturb the environment. This is the sickness of leftism. This is the idiocy of the Democratic National Platform. This is the treason of Barack Obama. The treason. And send it to the FBI. I could care less. Somebody can put a bullet in me, but I'm not going to shut up. Radical environmentalism to the mad rush for a government takeover of health care. They want to control everything from Washington. This represents the antithesis of our founding principle of limited government. The very reason for the Constitution is to put chains and shackles on the arms and hands of government. George Washington said, government like fire. <clears throat> It is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. And he said, like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. George Washington was saying it's bad enough that you have to have government to be your servant. You know, we're supposed to be called public servants. But he said, if it ever becomes your master, you're, you're in a world of trouble and you may not recover. It is a fearful master. Well, the master now is, is running almost every area of Americans' lives. Control of everything from Washington. Antithesis of limited, limited government. If these six power-hungry liberals are not stopped, there will be no individual freedom left. The same people that are bankrupting industries over their misguided love affair with spotted owls, snail, darwin, fish, whales, and numerous other so-called endangered species have absolutely no problem legislating for the ongoing murder of the unborn child. There is your real endangered species, the unborn child, who are all made in the Im image of God. 
This is a sign of mental derangement. It is satanic. These people are sick and are a sign of the coming age of Antichrist. They speak to us of this nonsensical thing called a jobless recovery. After they spent $800 billion to stimulate the economy and try to have a recovery, they call it a jobless recovery. What kind of nonsense is that? And what kind of idiots does the left think that we are that we actually buy into such ridiculous terminology? <clears throat> the economy is not coming back. There's no such thing as a jobless recovery. Such ridiculous concocted terminology only serves to show us how truly arrogant they are, thinking we are stupid enough to believe such nonsense. Bailouts, stimulus programs, borrowing money from communist China, printing money out of thin air at the Federal Reserve are all delivering us to a state of indebtedness that is irrevocable. I wrote this two years ago. The indebtedness is now $15 trillion and climbing at the rate of $100,000 every five seconds. We are almost finished. The dollar is almost finished. And when that happens, you're not going to be able to afford to live or drive to work or anything else. It's irrecoverable. Standard of living is plunging. You know there's a mortgage foreclosure crisis, a housing crisis. There, there are more crises that we can deal with. These guys are not going to fix it. It's going to take a miracle of God for us to save the nation. Now, back when I wrote this in 2009, the unemployment rate had just hit 10.2%. It's back to down around 9. The actual figure is closer to 18 to 20. It doesn't take into account the people that have given up looking for work or the many thousands who are underemployed and working only part-time as corporations slash their bottom line by making people work part-time so they don't qualify uh, for benefits. And that's another thing that's happening. There's only a portion of the great damage being done by the destructive policies of Obama and company. Elections have consequences. And Americans become so lazy, greedy, ignorant, and historically illiterate that they have welcomed this takeover in the 08 elections by dem giving the Democrats a majority in the House, Senate, and White House. Now back to leftism is the damnation of the human race. I hope you're awakening to the fact that the country is being destroyed and therefore your future is being destroyed. And if you plan on voting for a leftist president next time around, you can kiss your world and your dreams and your pursuits, you can kiss it all goodbye. That's how serious this thing is. And I don't say that as a born-again Republican. I say that as a conservative and a born-again Christian that understands what God has to say about government and human freedom. We got some stopping power back in 2010. This communist steamroller was slowed down for the moment. The country's future is not just about us. It's not about our dreams and our future and careers and our sports pursuits or whatever. The country is about the fact that we are the stabilizing force on planet Earth against tyranny. That's what we've been. God did it. God gave it to us. And our Christian foundation is the reason for the outpouring of the aid and the help in even fighting other people's wars that cannot fight for themselves. And the greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. The gospel of Christ and the word of God are behind our success. Freedom is predicated on righteousness. We'll come back to it, or we're going to be destroyed. And finally, 10 on that list, on the outline, is America's only hope, and yours as well. In short, it is repentance and revival. It is a return to the Word of God. It is a return to the Ten Commandments. It is a return to an understanding that we are not evolved from cosmic slime or a one-celled amoeba where all the conditions were just right, the odds against which are in the millions to one at some time a couple hundred million years ago. It's in realizing what the psalmist said when he said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He said, in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. The psalmist is talking about God <coughs> knew him before he was even found. He said, my substance was not hid from thee. The substance, the male and female portions that come together to generate human life. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was curiously brought in the lower parts of the earth, God knew our names before we were born. And we're fearfully and wonderfully made creations of the grand designer, the greatest 
of intelligent designers. Let's go quick. How much time I got? Um, 16 minutes. 15? Okay. Real quick. Is this thing blocking anybody of seeing this right here? Let me slide this out. I didn't do it. Real quick. Rome, superpower, military, crushing, mightiest empire the world has ever seen. God chose to birth Christianity right here while the Roman Empire, the war machine, was in place. They were unchallengeable. God did that. Before them, there were the Assyrians, there was, there was Babylon, there was Persia, there was Greece that was a little tougher, and then Rome was symbolized as iron in the statue of Daniel. I think it's chapter 9 or chapter 11, maybe chapter 9. The beast that Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream and said, you are this head of gold. And the statue represented nations and world history of the Old Testament time period. The head of gold was Babylon. Then there were the arms and chest of silver. That's the Medo-Persian Empire. Two arms. The twin empire. Then there was Greece. The belly and thighs were of brass. That's Alexander the Great conquering in the entire known world by the time he was like 23 or 24 years old. And then Rome. The legs are made of iron. And the strongest of the empires is where God chose to birth Christianity right under their nose to prove that little is much when God is in it. To prove that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. To prove that the gospel of Christ is the most powerful ideology that you can taste or embrace. And it shattered and conquered the Roman Empire. They couldn't handle a teacher from Galilee and his 12 disciples. And Christianity triumphed even over Rome. This New Testament time period represents roughly 6,000 years. And down here, after China, after Japan, after uh, uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, and all the, all the countries of, of thousands of years past, who, by the way, had thousands of years head start on us, wouldn't you think that they'd have gotten it right? Wouldn't you think that they could have developed some kind of stable, strong, peaceful, productive civilization by now? And ask yourself the question, how is it that after over 5,000 years of time, somebody finally gets it right. Is it a cosmic accident? Is it sheer coincidence? Not by any means. It is a miracle of the living God developing and building a nation that finally would get it right. Going to this book to figure out how to build a government that would secure human freedom and security and blessing and a decent manner of life and even become one that pours out blessings all over the world. And Isaiah 33, 22, if you care to write that down, is the place where the founding generation discovered God's pattern for the constitutional republic when it says the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. Judge, judicial, uh, lawgiver, legislative, king, executive. He, God, will save us. That's why your money says in God we trust. Thankfully, it's still there. That's why the Pledge of Allegiance says one nation under God. And that is proof positive that freedom is predicated on righteousness. Our success story is anchored in right thinking, even in the political realm. So this is left and right. This is, this is man's best attempt at government. This is God's answer to man's pathetic failures in designing government and particularly the satanic government. May 1st of 1776, this platform was put forth by the Bavarian Illuminati, Adam Weishaupt, Jesuit priest, defected from Roman Catholicism, decided to form a world government under his control and his secret society and abolish all others by way of corrupting governments and not through religion. So he's a Jesuit defector. He comes and, and comes up with six plank platform. Abolish private property. Abolish your right to inherit anything from your family when they pass on. Abolish all sex laws and moral codes. Abolish patriotism to national states because they want a world government with themselves in control. Abolish all ordered government except for theirs. Abolish religion based on faith in God. These six planks were revised and expanded by Marx and Engels in 1848 in their documents called the Communist Manifesto. And it has ten planks instead of six. And because of our pathetic slide into stupidity, greed, laziness, ignorance, historical illiteracy, we now have about seven planks of the Communist Manifesto in place at the federal level in our country now. We are so sick and so far gone. 
It leads to mediocrity. It takes, it takes power and influence by war, death, and destruction. It ultimately leads to the reign of Antichrist. And when, when America ceases to perform her mandate from God, her divine mission and purpose, which was to be, as Ronald Reagan said, a shining city on a hill that we could, we could export truth and export a better way of doing things, a better form of government, help people to, to institute democracy and have free elections so that the people have a voice and they're not just continuously ruled over by kings and queens and barons and dukes and lords. We would help them do that. But the biggest blessing that America has been in the world that we became the missionary headquarters, bastion of human freedom, lighthouse of God's truth, and poured it out all over this world. And when we cease, as we are ceasing now, to be God's shining example of a Christian city on a hill. He'll be done with us, and the whole thing is over with. That's how late it is. That's how late it is. So on the right, we began with the Mayflower Compact. It's Thanksgiving week. The pilgrims drafted a document because they landed off course, didn't have a charter for the place that they first landed, so they drew up an agreement among the people on the Mayflower called the Mayflower Compact. And that document is the foundation stone for the Declaration. The Declaration leads us to the Articles of Confederation, then the Constitution, finally, which is the longest-lasting government constitution on the face of the earth, bar none, while other countries are going through continuous revolt, revolution, change of forms of government. Ours is the longest-lasting because it is anchored in God's truth. It's anchored in the rock of Scripture. The pilgrims drafted this compact, and the first sentence of the Mayflower Compact says, in the name of God, amen. That's your first founding document as Americans. <clears throat> Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, we the undersigned do covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. Oh, they mentioned politics. For our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. What are the aforesaid ends, the aforementioned goals and aims? What are they? In the name of God, amen, <clears throat> for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. That's the foundation of this country, and we have been systematically denying it and now spitting on it and trampling it into the earth via a left-leaning Supreme Court majority through the 60s and 70s just destroyed our foundations. Let me go there right now, quick. Post-World War II. We transferred from a spiritually based nation that loved God and sought Him and everything to materialism. We spoiled ourselves rotten, lost the work ethic, and it all became about gain and houses and lands and money. 60s was characterized by rebellion. Notice that right as that takes place, we throw God out of the public schools. We declare war on the unborn child in 73. 70s is the beginning of the sexual revolution. Marriage begins to fall apart. Rome collapsed first cause of the collapse of Rome is the rapid rise in divorce and the undermining of the sanctity of the home. Edward Gibbon summarizes the fall of Rome in these five causes. He's a secular historian. He's not a Bible believer in any, any stretch. But he wrote the most voluminous treatise on Rome, its rise and fall. And Gibbon, the non-believer, says the first sign of destruction is that the home falls apart. And that's what happened to us in the 70s. The 80s is the homosexual and lesbian revolution. It's worse than that. Now it's the transgender revolution. It's worse than that. It's surgically changing the gender in which God created them male and female. That's how far we've gone. You understand? We are spitting in the face of a holy and righteous God, and we are not going to survive unless we repent and turn and cease from this evil because freedom is predicated on God's righteousness. Political correctness sets in in the 90s where we don't know who we are. We don't believe in good or evil. We don't have any enemies. We don't want to offend anybody. And our enemies are sensing, like a shark sensing blood in the water, they are sensing our weakness, and they are preparing to deal the death blow to the United States and Israel. 2000, loss of all common sense. God gives us a chastising slap in the face, 9-11-2001. America, will you wake up? Will you repent? Will you come to your senses? That is a disciplinary hand of God via militant Islam as God in the Old Testament used the Babylonians, even taking his own people into captivity then by way of chastisement and correction and discipline. And I sense that God has done the same thing to us. This is our last call. 9-11 is our last call to wake up. We had a revival for about six weeks. 
People flooding into the churches. But America's ignoramus preachers didn't know much about Islam. And I sat in a church for four weeks and waited and waited and waited for the pastor to say something. Dear God, say something about what has just happened. And after four weeks, I said, let the dead bury the dead. And I left the place. At the end of the fourth service, he said something like this. Well, people, I know some of you are upset about some of the things going on in the country and in the world, but I just want you to know it's not our job to uh, change the world. It's just our job to shine. That is pathetic. That is puke, vomit pathetic. It's one of the worst statements I've ever heard a preacher make. Because we are to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. And that salt before the days of Freon is the preserving element in civilization. And the church... From Timothy writing, Timothy receiving instruction from the Apostle Paul, he tells Timothy the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, God's truth, which covers all truth. Oh yes, we're to change the world, and we did change the world. We did change the world. We started off by proclaiming the existence of the Creator and the existence of the laws of nature and nature's God, first paragraph. We are called to a separate and equal station among nations by the laws of nature and of nature's God. Second paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That means they're obvious to the most casual observer. What are these truths that the founding generation declared based on Protestant Reformation, Pilgrim, Puritan, Bible teaching? Self-evident truths that all men are, number one, created equal. They're created, not evolved. That implies a creator, does it not? Number two, they are endowed by their creator, and endowment's a gift. They are given by the creator certain unalienable rights. You can't put a lien against them. You can't take them back. God gives these rights, not government. And the whole left side of the equation says that rights come from government, and the only rights you're going to have are the ones that they codify. But rights ultimately come from God. And then it says that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life, God breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Liberty, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. And the pursuit of happiness means you chase after it, go after it, you sweat, you toil, you educate yourself, you apply your God-given abilities. You pursue happiness. It's the opposite of a government paycheck and a welfare-stimulating bailout of some kind. It's the opposite. And so leftism is damnation and leads to the satanic end-time blood nightmare regime of the Antichrist. The Declaration of Independence, based on the laws of nature and nature's God, leads to life worth living, human freedom and liberty, the work ethic, the wealth of the nation that provides for the research and development, the excess whereby we can build the greatest hospitals, the greatest schools, have the greatest military, and continue to be the defender of human freedom, and the left, and right now, Obama and company, they are lining up with this and destroying every founding principle and every principle of the Lord God Almighty. And I need to clarify one thing after saying that. Do not confuse philanthropy and Christianity with government benefit programs. Let me explain that. It is definitely true that Lord Jesus Christ taught his followers and all of us down to this time. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, care for the sick, provide for the needs of those who cannot fend for themselves, the infirm. That's an obvious fact of the word of God. And we've done it and done it and done it, but government has usurped that position by handing out so much cash and benefits and programs that now we have half the population dependent on government for their daily bread. Lord's Prayer says, give us this day our daily bread to God. Leftism leads to the replacement of God with the institution of human government. And we are this close to having it fully in place. So the right side of the equation leads to Human happiness based on God's design, and he even used us to bless the rest of the world with it. And I know I'm out of time now. What do we got left? One minute. Oh, come on. I'm sorry. Oh, all right. Question quick. Yeah, go ahead. You mentioned uh, a couple times that, like, it's, it's crazy of leftists 
to you know care about like the environment over not to care or to, to preserve the environment or save animals over um, maybe like it's pretty insane time. while we're saving whales and killing babies can anybody agree with that well, it's insane mm -hmm. Um, I think there's more of an overpopulation with uh, humans. Have you ever been in an airplane? Animals. Have you ever been up in a jet and flown over the United States? Did you look out the window? Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be a little sure. Look, 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 look. look. The, land the, the population, Jim, what's the stat? The population of the earth would fit inside the state of Texas, if I'm right. The whole thing, is that right? The whole population of the earth would fit in Texas and have room to stand without bumping into the first day. It's insanity. That's left this tree-hugging, new-age, mosquito-worshipping insanity. It's insanity. It's not a population problem. It's a government problem. It's a heart problem. It's an industry and work ethic. It's a God's design problem because the governments of impoverished nations are evil, and they haven't adopted government of, by, and for the people under God's design. I'm not yelling at you. <laughs> Anybody else real quick? Got to go. Got to go. Yeah. So you truly overall feel that, as many other people have started to feel, that our government programs and sanctions have actually made the individual person too dependent on society. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ben Franklin said this early on. He said the best way to, to put a solution to national poverty is to make the person uncomfortable in his poverty and the shame and disgrace of not working and not having a job and sitting home uh, would cause him to pursue his own wealth and career. Anyway, that, that's, a, that's a family thing. The work ethic is out of the Word of God. The Word of God says, if any man worketh not, neither should he eat. And of course exception is made for those that cannot work physically, they can't do it, or mentally impaired, and that's the job not of government. That is the job of first family, then church and community. Never a government function. See, we're a million miles from God's design, and that's part of the reason that we are a bankrupt nation on the verge of complete collapse. Right? I love you guys. Enjoy being with you this morning. Thanks. destroyed uh, by the forces of God-hating damnable leftism that the ridiculously stupid and historically illiterate population of this country has seen fit to elevate to positions of power in the executive branch.